The monster called crude oil theft in Nigeria has been gaining momentum in recent times from both governments and relevant stakeholders, as this menace has not only adversely affected the country's crude oil production output, but also the entire performance of the economy. In the light of this, the federal government has shown a more significant desire to combat oil piracy in recent weeks, as the Nigerian Navy recently shut down 14 illegal refineries uh, that, um, in the Niger Delta region and is on the hunt for more. Well, let's talk more about this and see what this means, of course, for the Nigerian environment. I'm being joined live in the studio by senior economist and impact research and approach here, Nigeria Limited, Mr. Tosinge. Thank you so much for your time. It's good to have you in the studio. Thank you for having me. Yes, interesting report by, by, by ProShare there. Uh, first, I'd like you to give us an overview of understanding what the situation is at this time. How bad is it? Because I know that uh, we have the capacity of about 2 million, yeah. and um, we, OPEC is giving us about 1.8. 1 1 yeah. And at the end of the day, what are we doing? I saw a report of about less than a, uh, uh, a million yeah. sometime during this week. What is really playing out? Uh, thank you once again for having me. And um, as you've said, it's, it's, it's quite a bad situation yes, we have now. And uh, so, uh, but what we find out really in this report is that um, uh, the Nigerian uh, oil and gas is actually under siege, if we can call mm. it that way, because um, there are threats from the global scene, and at the same time, there are threats on the domestic scene for the country. So, uh, as you said, truly, um, as at the last um, OPEC uh, monthly oil market report, that's the one you were quoted at um, for August, it actually shows that uh, we are producing. Uh, less than a hundred million barrel now. In fact, around uh, nine hundred and seventy-two uh, thousand barrel per day, which is making us the third in Africa. Uh, you recall that some months ago we were just the first in Africa, and now we are uh, the third. Now, all of this we can attribute it to what we are talking about, the crude oil tape. And um, as I've said, really. Uh, there are those issues that are mitigating against us on the global scene. Those are the global threats. And uh, when we look at that, it, we detailed it actually in the report. Uh, we have those, um, the imbalance in, the terms of, in terms of supply and demand, which is, again, which is uh, increasing um, oil prices. And for us, you would think that uh, we're supposed to be enjoying the increase in oil prices uh, that we're seeing now around uh, 90. Yeah. Uh, you would think that we're supposed to to be jubilating, but uh, quite sadly, the government had even said that uh, around uh, seventy dollar per barrel is what is ideal for them because of you know the issue, the subsidy issue. So that's a different conversation. But I'm saying that uh, uh, the supply and demand imbalance in the first place is a threat for us. And again, there's also the climate uh, change, change that we're talking about. You know, we want to limit the global uh, warming below uh, two degrees Celsius. So that's a threat on its own. And of course, that particular threat also comes with another one, which is the financing. I'm sure you are aware that um, historically, we depend on some of these um, advanced nations for financing our projects. Yeah. And so uh, the fact that they are pushing uh, a climate change now, the one to go into renewable, means that uh, we may not be having such financing for our project. So that's a threat on it too. But then when we now come back to, uh, to domestic economy, yeah. we have a number of threats. I must say that um, crude oil is not the only issue, but um, we narrowed it down that really was the major one. And we find out that crude oil is the major one, but not the only one. Of course, we have um, aging infrastructure. All our um, assets in the nation, yeah. they are so old. Some of them, uh, the nameplate capacity that you are seeing online or the regulator post is actually, uh, the objective capacity is way lower than that. Maybe uh, within 10% uh, of that uh, nameplate capacity. So it's a challenge on its own. But um, we said, as I said, we said, what's the major one really? And that's the crude oil. Oh, no. And that's what informed our, uh, our going into this report because as per share, we have an annual report and we have special reports. So this is one of the uh, special report. So uh, as an objective, we set out actually to contribute to the national discourse and even elevate the discussion around this creative and of course, again, understand the lapses that create the challenge so that um, we can really uh, try to deal with the issue. After we identify the lapses, we'll be able to uh, use a data-driven approach to solve this issue. So that 
really informed this uh, report, the anatomy of uh, crude oil theft. Beautiful stuff. I, I see that, um, of course, the report also highlights the need to fast track the PIA one way or the other, as mm -hmm. that will uh, help um, for strategic engagement with oil producing um, uh, communities. Mm -hmm. uh, government is also handing over to some people to safeguard this pipeline. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, we know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So what do you think of, uh, how does the PIA come in in all of this? Yes, I think um, uh, we commended the PIA in the report, and uh, it's quite a beautiful um, uh, act. Uh, uh, actually, it's been long coming. Over yes, 20 yes, years. 20 something years. <laughs> so, he, so we commended it, and of course, uh, it really does some things in some instances. In fact, we saw it as one of the uh, uh, measures that were actually supposed to curb this issue of crude oil theft, but um, it's limited in its capacity. Maybe because we're even dragging the implementation in the first place. Of course. Uh, you, there's, been a, there's been an extension, uh, subsidy, subsidy removal, removal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we can go on and on. All of those issues. So you see that in the first place, we were meant to resolve the issue yes. with the PIA, yes. but again, we are dragging it. And that speaks to the fact that in Nigeria, what we are actually known for is that we know how to design policy. But when it comes to implementation, you see what we're doing with this now. And, and of course, um, uh, investors, in the process of all of this, they are looking at us. Uh, how are these people looking at it? Because um, in one of, the, uh, one of the dimensions we quoted in the report, we're looking at the diplomacy aspect of it in the sense that uh, when nations are approaching us now, they want to engage us. It's actually in the oil and gas, majorly. You remember yeah. the Poland that came around recently. Yeah. They want to engage us in terms of the oil and gas, but if we are facing this issue of crude oil theft, now it means that we may not have anything to present on the world scale. And you remember, I think uh, you quoted earlier in the, uh, in the show, you quoted the report that um, uh, oil and gas still account for 80% of our merchandise trade for uh, the Q2, uh, the foreign trade report that was released, 80% of uh, the crude oil. Now, signifying that it's still a major component of our foreign trade. But yet, we are, we will think that uh, because it accounts for 80%, we're doing well, but really, it's actually weighing down the value of our trade. So in that instance, it's really, uh, there is really need to fast track the, uh, the implementation of the PIA because we will be shortchanging ourselves if we are not really doing it as it is obvious what we're having in, in, in terms of delaying the PIA now. Mm. Um, let's not talk about technology and um, other video sensor and uh, other innovative solutions. The likes of Saudi Arabia yeah. have instituted and I think it's working uh, perfectly for them. Uh, can we do all of that in this part of the world? Mm, yes, I think it's one of the uh, quick fixes that we think in the report that we, we, we can actually deploy um, technology. And um, there is a section really that deals with the Saudi uh, Aramco model in the sense that how they were able to de uh, deploy technology to solve their own issue. And then, uh, but then what, what, what we find out is that to, to commend the regulator and the, uh, the major operator in our uh, oil and gas industry, the NNPC, uh, we also identify in the report that they've actually done uh, some things in that instance. In fact, uh, we find out that uh, currently now they have um, a command, um, uh, command center where they actually monitor issues around our oil and gas infrastructure across the country. So we commended that. And, uh, but we again find out some of those things are not uh, really real time. They, they, they are not, uh, let me say, dynamic. They are rather static than dynamic. So in the sense that uh, we, we, we are looking at a situation whereby uh, real time, 24 hours, you're capturing it in a video, what is going on. So we're looking at that kind of a model that was adopted by uh, Saudi Aramco. We're looking at that model for us as a quick fix for the issue in terms of uh, curbing that. But again, we also identify that we've done something in that instance, NNPC, uh, I'm saying, uh, they have done uh, this um, phone app that they launched. It's also a technological innovation in that instance where they tell uh, people in the around the host community to report incidents of uh, theft. So, of course, that one is uh, could be working because I, I think, uh, and one thing why, why we think it will work is that um, uh, we saw that uh, there is an incentive if you report. So, uh, we, we know that uh, there is poverty in the land and, of course, people may be incentivized to actually report those incidents. But again, it depends on uh, what the, uh, if the 
oil thieves are also engaging those people, then it becomes a battle of who is incentivizing the community more. So, but um, as I said, also in the report, we also looked at a situation whereby we looked at technology from the perspective of uh, the government and also from the perspective of the oil thieves. And we're saying that uh, we put a matrix, we call it uh, the power matrix, actually. We're saying that um, it depends on whose technology is actually superior is what will tell us the scale of this oil theft. So if, as a nation, we have a superior technology than those oil thieves, then we should expect oil theft to be minimal. But again, if those oil thieves actually have a superior technology compared to the state-owned, then, of course, we know what the incidence would be. Because, really, uh, uh, we, we looked at it that the scale of oil theft now, when you look at um, what we call uh, earth tapping and coal tapping, Come on, those things require every technology that an, an ordinary man, a common man, Ex can that, not that, that, that's, that's my next question. I was going there. The kind of expertise, the kind mm. of skills. You know, this is not just being done by just anybody. We're mm. talking crude oil theft here. This is mm -hmm. not um, water theft or whatever. So, what do you think? And those that also buy these products, mm. I'm also worried. What can is there anything that can be done along that line? Uh, Yes, really, there, there's something that can be done. But as I said first, I think we need to look at uh, uh, the, our technological innovations. Yeah. We need to review that. Because as I said, we put a, a, a power matrix there. And really, it's just a balance. It's just what is expected. If they have superior technology, definitely you expect those thieves to steal more because of their technology. As I said, coal tapping, hot tapping, they are not done with crude implements. They are not done with uh, O's and cutlasses. They are done with every uh, equipment. So, it, it, and as much as those people have those technology, they will continue to vandalize and steal all of this uh, 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 pipeline. But again, coming back to what you said, really, and um, truly, we, we, we find out that um, the scale of uh, crude oil theft in Nigeria uh, suggests that um, uh, five things are involved, really. And what are those things? Supporting infrastructure. Those, without those infrastructure, we will not be recording the scale we are talking about here. As I've said, in, in, in terms of what they use to vandalize this uh, pipeline. Now, and again, we're talking about political will. Those folks ask political will because you, the, the scale of all those things, we're talking about, sometimes we're talking about 300,000 barrels. You can move that thing if, uh, uh, where do you want to pass if yeah. you don't, if, if exactly. you're not having people at your back? So that must be there. And, and of course, we talk about the technology to those people. As I said, those people have the technology. They have um, 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 uh, supply chain partners. Now, as you talked about now, who are those buying yeah. all of this crude? Now, if they don't have those supply chain partners, they, would not they will not continue the business. But again, we find out that really there are external buyers and there are internal buyers. Mm. Now, you remember when we were talking about the fact that uh, uh, the illegal refinery we are talking about in the country, who are those supplying mm. them? Now, recently, now the, the Nigerian Customs Service, we were talking about intercepting uh, two tankers uh, yeah. in, in, in Ijebo. They, Filled with um, uh, uh, dirty fuel, they call it illegal fuel, something like that. Now, where do those people get the food, the fuel, the crude oil that they use to refine those products? Yeah. So you see that um, from the internal scale, there are there are those things that do not even go outside. But again, there are some that go outside. You remember the um, the Norwegian tanker that was found on our ship recently. So you, you tell us the scale of all of these issues that we're talking about. So there is such a massive, it's, it's such a massive cartel, let me call it that way, that we're dealing with here. Mm. Now, you're talking about um, a robust maritime strategy to tackle this menace. Mm -hmm. Please explain this to us better. Uh, good. I, I, I Thank you. That uh, We just talked about the two segments now, those that are internal and those that are external. external. Now, for those that are external, really, many of those things go through the waters and the Nigerian waters, the Nigerian maritime space. And um, But what we are looking at in that instance is that um, we detailed it actually in the, uh, the last section of the report, quite detailed, comprehensive there. And what we are saying is that uh, beyond the, uh, the Nigerian um, Navy, doing the security aspect of yeah. all of these things. Let's have a comprehensive uh, national maritime strategy. So we're not only uh, pursuing uh, what the Navy designed, because currently I must say that uh, the Nigerian uh, Navy, they have uh, another strategy. 
But of course, that's not a substitute for the national maritime uh, strategy because when we talk about the national maritime strategy, it covers both uh, this uh, security that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. It covers the governance of that aspect. And of course, it also covers the blue economy. Now, that blue economy is just what, what we're talking about, sustainable use of this our ocean to improve our GDP, to improve our standard of living. And at the same time, we are keeping preserving the heads of our maritime. So that's basically what it mean by the blue economy. So we're saying that let's look at an holistic approach to our uh, the maritime sector because as we as it is now, uh, we do not have it. We do not have the maritime as a uh, as an entity in our GDP. You remember, it's just lumps up under uh, the uh, the merchandise trade as a maritime transport. So, but, but, but we're saying that if we take an holistic approach to it, everybody is committed. So if a ship is coming, there are, this, the, the strategy would have defined what the economic benefit of all of those ships, and the Navy will have their own segment to hit. So everybody is assessing our waters from an holistic uh, view, not just because as it's coming now, some, some you know, um, I, I know that um, uh, the stakeholders in that instance, they are pushing up uh, some advocacy because really, uh, as I said, we detail some of this issue there. And, 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 and really, we, we, we believe really that if we pursue this thing, there are a number of opportunity. We, in, in fact, we have an infographics in the report that details so much benefit mm. that we can derive mm. from this um, yeah, that, that, that we can derive from uh, uh, the maritime okay. if we actually develop it. Okay. But um, we, 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 we are looking at it in such a way that um, um, if, if we really want to develop this thing, all hands must be on this. Let's come to, to, to an agreement. Let's design this strategy because we find out that from the four elemental uh, economy of nature, we are, only, we are only focusing on the head. There are still the waters, the fire, the hair. We are not harnessing all of those resources as much as we should. So let's harness these resources in this instance, especially now that we are talking about uh, the climate change. Remember, we're talking about the climate change. So we know that blue economy is, uh, is a subset of the green economy. So we are saying that uh, if we really develop this particular uh, uh, sector as a maritime strategy, in the same way, we'll be contributing to GDP, especially now that we need it. You remember, Lagos is bordered with so much water. Yeah. We, we, we can really explore this in this instance. So as much as we're pursuing um, a resolution to the crude oil theft, we can as well gain for the economy, increase our GDP, increase the standard of living, and of course, we'll be better for it, really, as a nation. What's your outlook? Let's wrap up in one minute. Uh, what, what are your right expectations, despite these challenges, from proceeds from the oil and gas industry? Uh, yes, um, the proceeds from the oil and gas is, um, as much as the crude oil theft is there, definitely yeah. it will continue to be under threat. Yeah. So we really need an urgent solution, and yeah. that is why we have lent our voice at Proche yeah. to this issue, because really, it's a national emergency now, I must declare. It is a national emergency. In, in, in fact, in uh, page 22, there about with details how it is affecting all aspects of the economy. Mm -hmm. In fact, we did a dimensional analysis of it. It's affecting the political issue. You remember, all these uh, presidential aspirants have started giving their own voice of what they would do yeah. because of this. So we have the political dimensions of it. We have the diplomacy. I just talked about the um, relation, the foreign relation. We have the military aspect of it. We have uh, the social aspect of it. Come on, people are being displayed in those oil-producing regions because as much as they are stealing the oil, they are also affecting their, their livelihood negatively. So people have been displaced. So it, 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 it's an aspect that we looked at. And of course, we looked at um, the economy, which everybody knows the you know, revenue, yeah. FX, and yeah. is affecting us. Of and of course, again, the financial uh, risk associated with it. Because we find out that really, because of all of this issue, our cost of production happens to be one of the highest among oil producing nations in the world. Because this crude oil theft. Mm. And again, the, even the pricing of our products in the international sector, you know that Bonnie light, the way it is Bonnie light, so it's a grade that, that command premium normally. 
But because of the our issue, yeah. people could sign a contract now and they will go back the next time. They may not have up to the capacity you say they will have. So they demand a discount in that instance because of all of this issue that we're facing as a nation. So we really need an urgent solution. I think that's why we have come up with this report. This, this will be a continuous uh, discussion because it's really a very interesting. When I've been speaking to Mr. Tosege, he is a senior economist and impact research at Porsche in Nigeria uh, Limited. I must thank you so much for making sense of this. But like I said, we'll keep a tab on this very important topic. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank all you. Right, all right.